Yes, I'm 18 years old and I'm wearing pajamas that are aged 12 to 13, but we're not going to talk about that today. <laughs> Apple Computers was started in a garage. Facebook was started in a college dorm. And today, I'm going to tell you how my teammates and I discovered something that could potentially aid the global food crisis in a bedroom, which might somewhat explain what I'm wearing today. We are living in an era where the greatest discoveries, the greatest inventions, don't necessarily come from high-tech labs or behind the walls of major corporations, but can come from ordinary teenagers in their pajamas. I am just like everyone here in the audience today. I'm an ordinary teenager with plenty of curiosity and an appetite for risk-taking. And my journey has the simplest of beginnings when a gardening mistake led us to find out about a bacterium called Rhizobium. My teammate Emer was in the garden with her mom and they were growing peas. But she noticed a weird growth on the roots of the plants, kind of like a wart. She told Sophie and I about this in school the next day, and we were curious, so we asked our science teacher what they were. She told us that these nodules are home to a special bacterium in the soil called Rhizobium that aids the growth of legume crops, such as peas, beans, and clover. Basically, what this bacteria does is it goes into the nodules on the roots of those plants, and it changes the nitrogen in the air into nutrients for them to grow. But in doing so, it lets off a lot of other chemicals and compounds that nobody really knew much about. <laughs> Truth be told, initially, we wanted to investigate the antibacterial properties of these chemicals, but we were set straight pretty quickly that this would be a non-runner. So we did a bit more research, and all of a sudden, we had this crazy idea. Sure, this bacteria could aid legume crops, but what if it could do more than that? What if we could use this superhero bacteria to grow more useful crops, like wheat, oats, and barley? We took our first steps by figuring out how to grow the bacteria and built a homemade incubator and bioreactor out of things that you'd find lying around at home or we could source from our community. Incubators are quite expensive, but we found a way to make a cheap one that worked perfectly. We live in a little fishing port, so we went to the docks and got polystyrene fish boxes and used them as an insulator and then used a home thermostat and a light bulb to regulate the temperature. We just kept building and building until we had everything we needed, even just using bits of Lego that we stole from our cousins or spare floorboards that we found in the attic. Eventually, we took over my spare bedroom with our equipment, something my poor mother wasn't particularly happy about. We launched into a period of incredibly intense experiments, and let me tell you, it was hard work. We grew the bacteria in a media solution, and then applied it directly to the seeds in precise amounts. We then set them to incubate in controlled conditions and checked their progress at regular time intervals, just to see if they had germinated. Our testing process meant that we had to inspect more than 1,000 seeds every six hours, which meant spending two hours staring at seeds at midnight before getting up at six o'clock in the morning to do it all over again. And if you think watching paint dry is boring, okay, watching seeds grow is so much worse. <laughs> we basically had two week blocks of less than four hours sleep per night. Now, take a moment to imagine three sleep-deprived teenage girls working in close proximity in a small bedroom under extreme pressure. My house was like a moody teenage war zone. We certainly were not stereotypical scientists during all this. Never once did we wear a lab coat. In fact, most of the time we were wearing our pajamas. Although I will say my hair did achieve that Albert Einstein look from time to time during the 6 a.m. readings. We had to be able to adapt. When an experiment didn't work, we had to figure out why and fix it, which could be challenging and a little disheartening at times. 
For example, during our early test experiments, we actually thought that we had gotten negative results because the bacteria that the, seed, the, the broth that the bacteria was grown in had affected the seeds. You see, the bacteria liked salt and needed it to grow, but the seeds reacted negatively to it. So we had to find a compromise between bacteria and seed to keep everybody happy. Eventually, we found a way around it by moving the bacteria into uh, sterile water after it had been grown, but that didn't change how upset we were when we first thought we had failed. But at last, the time came, the big day came to analyze our results, and we found out that we had done it. Using Rhizobium bacteria, we had decreased the time taken for germination of barley and oats by an average of 50%. So you might ask, why does this matter? Well, when we looked into it, we realized that seeds are at their most vulnerable between when they're first planted in the soil and when they begin to germinate or grow. By increasing germination rate, we were cutting the risk period where they're in danger of perishing due to drought, freezing, rotting, or predators in half, and giving the seeds more of a chance to survive. So following on from these results, we decided to go a step further and conduct a field trial to grow the plants to semi-maturity and to see if or how the bacteria affected the crops in their later life. Now, this is the part where everyone started to think we were crazy, because non-legumes can't form nodules on their roots, so everyone assumed that it wasn't going to work because the bacteria had nowhere to base itself or to live. But when we looked online, we couldn't find any solid proof that it was impossible, so we decided to give it a go anyway. In our minds, even if we tried it, and even if it didn't work, then we and the rest of the world would know for sure. So the time came for us to move from the bedroom to my garden, and we set up a mass scale field trial. We planted thousands of seeds with different treatment methods according to our research, and harvested them after a number of weeks. We then had to dry them in an oven for days on end to get rid of any moisture that might have affected our results. So my poor, long-suffering mother now had to go for days without the use of her oven. But the big day came again, and it was time for us to look at our data. And we found even more surprising results. With the bacteria, and with a certain treatment that we had made up ourselves, we had managed to increase the crop productivity of barley by 74%. We managed to almost double the amount of crops that were created from the same amount of seeds. But we, why was this happening? We couldn't ignore the fact that everyone had told us that it wouldn't work, and they had good reason. It shouldn't have worked because the crops didn't have nodules. But our experimental method was airtight, and we had statistically analyzed our results to a confidence level that was universally accepted in the scientific community. So we knew that we could trust our results. We had experimented on more than 12,000 seeds, after all, and taken more than 120,000 manual measurements. Well, the one thing that all the naysayers didn't realize is that they had underestimated the extra compounds and chemicals that Rhizobium lets off when it interacts with plants in the soil, because one of them had potential that nobody had ever seen before. One of the byproducts that was of little use when it came to legume crops actually aided the growth of cereal crops. It all came down to something called, now wait for it, an acylated chitin oligomeric backbone lipoketo oligosaccharide. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm going to save that explanation for another day. We could put our names on this and be proud in the knowledge that we had discovered something new. And what we discovered is something that could potentially have a huge impact on the world. There are already food shortages in the world at the moment. But with the rising population, this is only set to get worse. We are going to need to provide food for 9 
billion people by the year 2050, and for this we will need 50% more food. Our discovery could help with doing this, and it's completely natural. When I think back to that journey, I always think there's something special about the fact that our whole project, a discovery whose full potential has yet to even fully be realized, didn't come from a fancy lab with state-of-the-art equipment, but from a spare bedroom. I know it's kind of a pun, but I like to think of that room as one of those potting trays that you put a seed in to grow for a little while until it's ready to be moved out to the garden. It's where ideas are given a chance to grow and develop and evolve before they're ready for the real world. That's the key. It's where you take your first steps in the pursuit of an idea. It's where you take your first brave steps in changing the world. Because we don't need a fancy office block or endless funds, as long as we have an internet connection and determination. So it's time for us all to start thinking of our bedrooms as more than a place to sleep. The process of starting a project or organization can be quite intimidating, especially for a young person. We tend to jump ahead and imagine ourselves at the end of the road where there's tons of work and pressure and loads to lose. But the truth is, it's actually quite easy to take those first steps without putting yourself on the line too much. You don't have to wait until you're older to pursue the ideas that you've been keeping hidden inside your head. The time to start is now, whether you're 13 or 33. You simply need the courage to take the leap. It's as simple as looking around you and taking full advantage of the resources that you have readily available to you. What do you have at your disposal that you can use to get what you need done? Think of Facebook and Twitter. I'm sure everyone here has been scolded by a parent at least once in their lives for spending too much time on social media. But the magic of sites like Facebook is the connectivity they give to young people. You can trade ideas with young people from all over the world and collaborate on projects. You can watch tutorials on YouTube on how to code or on graphic design. We literally have the world at our fingertips. And we are lucky to live in a society of opportunity where if you need help, you can find it somewhere. There is nothing wrong with homemade. There's nothing wrong with do-it-yourself. And it is all about the journey, because experience is the best teacher. So we can jump in without being afraid of making mistakes, because even if we do, the only witness will be the four walls of our bedroom. And you can bet that you won't make that mistake next time. So go ahead, make those mistakes, learn from them, and keep moving forward. You can build yourself a support structure to help you get there. Your family, teachers, friends, even your pets, there's nothing wrong with involving them because you need that support. You need that help to get you through on the days when a line of code crashes your entire project or an experiment doesn't really work out or an idea falls through. Those days will come, but that's what makes it worth it in the end. When I think about the three years I spent in that spare bedroom, I can only describe it as magical. The new mechanism we discovered, the new mechanism that could change the world, was observed for the very first time within those four walls by three teenage girls in their pajamas. And we can have the pride of knowing that and of owning that. The fact is that we as young people have potential our prowess for all things tech, combined with boundless enthusiasm and a refusal to yield to the word no, makes us almost custom tailored to innovate. Every generation faces its challenges, sure, but we are lucky in that we are perfectly poised to tackle ours head on. We have the skills, and if we don't, we can learn them. We have the network, and if we don't, we can create it. It's our time it's our turn, and it's our future. 
We are the most connected generation this world has ever seen, and it's time to take advantage of that fact. We've been called the millennials, Generation Tech, Generation X, Y, Z, but why should we be remembered for a letter? I believe that the best generation we can be is Generation Why Not. If we push the boundaries, and work together and use the assets that are being built for us right now to connect us, to empower us. Nothing is impossible, no matter what people tell us. The reality is that today, more than ever before, it is possible for a teenager to change the world in their pajamas. So tonight, when you go home and you're in your bedroom changing into your pajamas, ask yourself, what will you change? Thank you. Yeah.